Hello guys and welcome back to this channel. Today I am going to use artificial neural network for the fault diagnosis of uh, solar of photovoltaic solar panels which we have been using in this series throughout. I think you guys are all aware with the data sets that are available. What are the faults, what are the features, what are the modes that we are using. So let's get started and finish it very quickly. This is going to be a very short video. So as usual, first we will import all the necessary libraries. These are the most important ones, standard scalar, transcripts, training and split. We don't need the PC. And this tool is just for the good product. So this is the same function I've been using to train, to split and transform the data set. And uh, what I'm doing in the import both data set uh, block, I'm importing the limited power mode as well as the so maximum power mode. So I'll import this and then I'm concatenating them. So if I see what are the fault labels I have, this is the fault label. So I have total 14 objects, sorry, I have total 16 objects. So each fault is for different mode, one for medium uh, and one for, uh, sorry, one for maximum power mode and L is for limited power. So I have total 14 fault classes to classify from using my artificial neural network model. In the next step, I'm going to do the splitting into train test split randomly and then doing the scaling of the data. So XSC train will be my scaled data for the train, XSC test will be my scaled data for the test. I have total 15,000 samples for the training and 6,000 samples for the test. Okay, next this is very important. So I am going to use uh, label encoder and two categorical. So let's see what, what, what does this thing do here. Okay, now that the data has been imported, I'm going to initialize this label encoder object. Here it is. I'm saving this in encoder and naming that as encoder. Then I'm going to use this encoder to fit my budget. On why am I doing this? Basically, right now I have total this 16, 16 classes. So I want to convert them in a format that my artificial neural network will be able to understand it. So first what I'm doing. Okay, so let's see what my white ring has. Oh yeah, so now we can see that my white ring is something like this. Here I have only the fault labels, different fault labels I have. Next, what will I do? I'll the, the encoder class that I object that I have initialized, I'll use that to fit on my on my screening data set. In the next step, I'm going to use the same encoder class to transform my this training data set into numbers. That's right. Okay, so now that the my label encoder is initialized, I'll, I'm fitting that on my training dataset and then transforming the training dataset. So if I just show you what the encoded Y is. Okay. So see, now I have all the values ranging from zero. See here, all the labels it has just uh, numbered them as I have 16 total 16 number of uh, classes. It has uh, numbered them from zero to 50. That's what my encoded Y is. But uh, this also I cannot feed directly into the neural network model because in my neural network at the output layer, I will have total 16 number of uh, hidden, say 16 number of uh, neurons for the prediction. So I need to convert it into a one hot vector. So for that, I'm going to use this two categorical, this two categorical function available from Keria, uh, from Keria's area. Okay, so now see, now everything has been converted. If I just see it zero, see it is a 14, uh, it is a 16 dimensional vector where the class is identified here. You see, it's 13, the first one is 13, and then the 13th position is separated. Okay, that's it. So that thing I'm going to do for the entire set, For this is for the training data, this is for the test data. That's it. And finally, I can, the class name of the uh, of the training data is shaped in this encoder dot classes. So if we just click them, you can get all the classes of the name. Or we need to do inverse transform, we can use the encoder class dot inverse transform. That's it. Now we are going to build build the neural network model for that. These are the things I have imported: model, input, dense, linear. Okay, and this is one important thing I have imported that is from the callbacks early stop. What does this early stop does? We'll see the next. Uh, we'll see the next part of this video. Okay, 
so initially what i'm doing i'm initializing my input the number of neurons in my input layer it will make x.shape 1 which will be the number of features and output class will be my number of classes so i'm using encoded classes the length of the encoded classes which is this one and that will be 16 and then i'm using uh, this input method available for, from DS to start to make the tensor in the shape of my input vector then i'm using i tried a various algorithm various number of uh, combination of hidden layer and all you can try it on your own as well and see which one prefers you which one you prefers for me this 1500 works very well so i am going to stick with it so first in the, uh, in the first hidden layer i have 15 neurons in the next hidden layer i have 100 neurons and finally i have uh, one hidden uh, finally in the last layer i have um, the number is uh, my output class which is here that will be 16 and activation I'm using is softmax and to create the model I'm using this so this will be my it will take the input as the visible which is which will give a tensor and uh, my output will be this one this entire part this it will use this as an output and in order to compile I'm using Adam optimizer categorically cross entropy as my loss function and matrices I'm using accuracy right. so if I finally see the model summary I have 13 in the input, then 15, then 100, then 16. I have total 7,000 parameters to print, including the biases, of course. Okay, now see, let's see what this early stopping loss. So, I imported this uh, from callbacks. I imported the early stopping function. So, first I need to initialize this uh, class into early stop object. So, in the first uh, parameter, it takes what you want to monitor. I want to monitor my validation accuracy. Because that's what I am looking to. And uh, then, well, how much patience? This patience refers to how much iteration you are going to wait if the validation accuracy doesn't start to improve. During the training, we want our validation accuracy to increase continuously, but after a time, it, if it does not improve, then there, are, then there are chances that we have already started overfitting the system or it has started degrading already. So, this 40 reference that I am going to wait for. 40 epochs before I decided that already the validation in the has achieved its maximum, then I'm going to stop my iterations. And that will be my final model. And uh, I'm using go to model.fit. My input is x uh, scaled training data. Dummy y is the one node encoded vector for the training data. I'm going to run it for 500 epochs because this early stopping is there, which will monitor it and stop it before that. Batch size I'm using is 500 because it's a very small dimensional data. And uh, then validation data. I'm using validation as that my test data which I have saved. I'm using that as my validation. Call access are so this one, whichever you have initialized, you can it here. Shuffle equal to group. All right. And uh, I'm also saving the model as HR file. So let's go and run this one. Okay. Okay. So our training has been finished. Early stopping is uh, has uh, short. Early stopping saw that our accuracy is increasing anymore, so it has stopped the training. Make this product. Yeah, it's very good. The accuracy is continuously increasing, and there is much more, not much difference between training and test, so you can see it's not at all overfeeded. And uh, our training was very good. After that, I'm going to use the trained model that I just trained to predict. And there is one catch while doing the prediction because the prediction will be in terms of uh, one odd factor, so first we need to Okay, fine. I will just tell you about it. So if I just do model dot predict on the test set, this is how the data set looks like. Right? To so the first one, yeah, it will be a sixteen, it will be a sixteen dimensional vector. Okay. So if I do the R max, then I'll see. Yeah, it identifies the twelve. Uh, the 12th uh, class, but I don't know what the 12th class is. So for that, I'm going to use the encoder, reverse transform function, to see what my 12 actually represents in my fault classes. Okay, express array. Skip it anyway. Okay. So my 12th represents F6L. So that is my fault class. Same thing I did for the entire array of white bread. So I first use uh, X test set to get the Y pred, then I use the R mix function to get the maximum value, then I use the inverse transform function to get the actual value of the fault. Then to see the matrices, I am uh, using the accuracy score, precision score, recall, and reference score. This. 
I'm going to print everything. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's 90s, almost 98% accuracy rating, 97.9%. So you can see it's almost 98% accurate. Without the confusion matrix. All right. So this is how the confusion matrix looks like. Just fairly good, fairly good. And what is misclassification rate? Misclassification rate is basically you can say one minus accuracy. You can say that one minus accuracy is misclassification. So here you can see the misclassification rate is 2.07 percent. And which was for the random forest algorithm, it was around 1.6 percent. Still, the random forest algorithm in this case is performing better than the neural network. So we can stick to the machine learning algorithm for the fault edges of this particular piece. And that was it for this video. And see you in the next video.